Greetings, this is Brother Stephan again, a student and witness of Yahashua, pronounced in the Greek, Jesus, whom in the English language is known as Jesus Christ. To all the inhabitants of the earth, I teach as a witness unto all nations the gospel of the kingdom. The purpose of this lesson is to teach God's sheep about the true Son of God. And we're going to jump right into the scriptures here. The name of this lesson is Jesus was Jesus was with God before the world began. And we're going to start the scriptures off in Genesis. So Genesis 1, this is in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Anytime you see something like this underlined, it means it's important. I'm, I'm going to come back to it later. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form. It was empty and void, means it was useless, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Um, this word deep means deep water, which you will um, see here in just a second. So basically, in the beginning, the planet that we know as Earth was only a massive planet of water. Nothing else existed. It was only water. And the Spirit of God moved upon the surface of the waters. Basically, the, the face of the waters is the surface, the surface of the ocean. Um, just to touch on and the Spirit of God so people know what this means. Um, if you go to Job 34, 14, and 15, it says, If he set his heart upon man, if he, referring to God, gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall return, turn again unto the dust. So what does all flesh need to survive here on earth? Well, we know what this is already. And that's oxygen. So even here in the book of Genesis, when it said, and the spirit of God moved upon the surface of the oceans, this is talking about oxygen. Oxygen that God gives us to breathe comes from God. It is in the Bible referred to as God's breath. Today, because of science, we know it as oxygen. So let's keep going. The first day. On the first day, God creates the galaxy. And God said, um, if you the reason that God said in there you these areas highlighted and underlined because I want to make a point later on. But we'll get back to that. So back to the first day when God's create the galaxy. And God said, Let there be light. When God said, Let there be light, he was talking about a milky, I mean a galaxy. Particular, he was referring to our galaxy, which we know as the Milky Way. Um, so God said, let there be light, and there was light. So God said, let there be a galaxy, and there was a galaxy. And God saw that the light, which is our Milky Way, that it was good, and God divided. He separated the light, which was the galaxy, from the darkness. Um, when God's talking about the darkness, Basically, all he is talking about is space, and space is a, a void that exists between celestial bodies. Um, so when God says, and God said, when God divided, separated the galaxy from the voided space, um, and galaxy have light because of the celestial bodies, and empty space is darkness, and God called the light day. That's where the galaxy is and the darkness, the space that did not have celestial bodies without light. He called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So there's I don't know if this is necessarily supposed to be an image of our Milky Way, but just so you can visualize what God created. Um, that is a picture of a Milky Way. 
a galaxy. So the second day, gods create the Earth's core and atmosphere. And God said, let there be a firmament. I intentionally didn't put the definition of firmament here because I wanted to explain it to you. So when God said, let there be a firmament, he said, in the midst, the midst means middle, of the waters, the ocean. So God put something in the middle of the ocean. And we already know what's in the middle of the ocean. What it is the Earth's core, which creates the atmosphere. So on the second day, God said, let there be a core in the middle of the Earth. And let it separate the waters from the waters. Basically, what happened here is when it says separate the waters from the waters, it's talking about the oceans from the clouds. Um, once God placed basically a smaller sun in the middle of the ocean, it created an atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere contains millions of billions of gallons of water um, in in the invisible vapor phase um, so on the pretty much on the second day um, when God put this um, hot core in the middle of the earth this is the reason why our earth has a water cycle um, and this is basically water gets evaporate evaporates into the atmosphere And God made the firmament, the inner core, and separated the waters, basically the oceans, which were under the firmament, atmosphere, from the waters, which is the clouds, which are above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. In other words, God called the atmosphere, um, the Bible used the term heaven, but today we simply use the word sky. So when God created, when God um, put this heart core in the middle of this large ocean, you can imagine just like if you have a some anything that's really hot and you run it under cold water, what happened? You get a lot of steam. Um, this steam um, is basically letting us know where the clouds came from. And so where we at in the evening and the morning were the second day. The third day, God creates um, dry ground, rivers, and vegetation. And God said, let the oceans under the sky be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Basically, the dry land is uh, comes from the firmament also. Uh, when you put the when God put the that hot molten ball in the middle of the ocean, um, the just like today how um, if volcanoes erupt underwater, um, the water cools the volcano acid, the acid, and it eventually becomes hard, creating a solid surface. This is the same principle of how the dry land appear. God placed a hot core in the middle of the earth as the water cooled it land appeared and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters um, which is which are which is the ocean called he seas and God saw that it was good and God said let the earth bring forth grass and herbs and yielding seeds and fruit and, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So basically what happened here, that's when the vegetation. So you have a planet of water. God puts a hot core in the middle of the water. Um, clouds are created. Uh, evaporation, evaporation system, water cycle is created, which creates land. After the land appear, God plants vegetation. Um, 
on the land. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seeds after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Now on the fourth day is when God creates the sun, the moon, and constellations. So let's go ahead and read this really quick. And God said, let there be lights. He was referring to the sun, the moon, and the constellations here. And the firmament. Um, so God said, let, so God said, let there be a sun and moon and constellations in the atmosphere of the sky, um, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament atmosphere of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. This is when God created this talking about the sun and the moon. The greater light, the sun, which is a lake of fire. Um, the reason I noted this in here, the lake of fire to rule the day, is because a lot of people do not believe in hell burning forever, the lake of fire, um, which is kind of ridiculous seeing that we have a lake of fire which we call the sun that has been in the sky um, since the beginning of time and um, the sun is most definitely a lake of fire there's a few scriptures i just want to read out to um kind of help those that doubt that the lake of fire is real know that the lake of fire is real if you go to matthew 8 11 and 12 it says and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven but the children of the kingdom this is the wicked people that rule the earth shall be cast out into outer darkness so what is outer darkness shall be cast out into outer space so they should going to be removed from the earth and cast into outer space and it say there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth now if you go to revelations 21 and 8 i have other scriptures i can use to confirm this but um this lesson is not about the lake of fire i'll cover that in another um topic but if you go to revelations 21 and 8 they say and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire the sun and brimstone this um, brimstone is a non-scientific term for sulfur. The sun has high levels of sulfur. So where the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So this is what we know. We know that the um, hell, the lake of fire, um, burns forever and ever and that it is not on this earth, not in the middle of, of this earth. The Bible says they shall be cast into outer darkness. And another thing that we know about hell, the Bible says most people that ever existed um, are going to hell. So we know hell have to be an extremely large place, a lot bigger than the earth. We have about 8 billion people living on earth today, so we can only imagine how many people ever existed. So um, the sun um, really fits every description in the Bible about the lake of fire and burning forever and brimstone. All right, so we're going to go back to he made the greater light, the sun, to rule the day. And the lesser light, which is the moon, to rule the night. He made the stars also. So we already read when God created the galaxies, the galaxy, the Milky Way. But when he on this day, when he created the sun and the moon, when it say and he created the stars also, this is when God creates the constellations. And I just have a, another photo here for your convenience, if you can see that. And God set them in the atmosphere of the sky and gave light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. 
So now we're here on the fifth day. Um, this is when God creates the fish and the birds. I'm really not going to read through this. The only thing I want you to pay attention to is once again, um, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundant um, moving creatures. And you know, the same thing happened and it was so. Uh, so we're going to get here um, on the sixth day is when God creates all animals on dry land. Um, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Um, this is animals after his kind um, cattle, which represents domesticated animals, creeping things represents insects and reptiles and beasts represents mammals um, of the earth after his kind. And it was so. So on the sixth day, God creates um, domesticated animals, insects, reptiles, mammals, dinosaurs, cats, dogs, all that stuff. All animals was created um, in one day. Um, animals did not evolve. They was created in one day. Um, and it was so. And also on the sixth day, it said, and God said, I'm actually going to underline this too, because this statement here is kind of, and God said, let us make man. Um, the reason I have Adam here, and like I say, I will go over this in another lesson too, because um, this can get pretty lengthy. The word in the original Hebrew was not man. The word in the original Hebrew was Adam. And um, I believe Adam was taken out on purpose, but I will explain that in another lesson. Um, right now, I want to stick as close to it as a topic as I can is that, you know, Jesus was um, with God in the beginning. So people can know exactly who Jesus is. The only other thing I want to point out in these sections is you keep seeing this. And God said, and God said, and God said, and it was so. That's very important that you understand that because I'm going to use um, those statements later on in the study. So in the Bible, there's only one other book that starts off with in the beginning. And that is the book of John wrote by John, the beloved disciple of Christ. And basically what John does, he sums up the book, the first chapter in the book of Genesis. He sums it up with three verses. And we're going to go over these verses and apply what John says back eventually back to the book of Genesis. So John, um, John 1, chapter 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So right there, in one verse, he sums up creation. Um, so if you go back to Genesis 1, in the beginning, it says, um, and in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, what I want to explain is why John referred in the in the book of Genesis uh, Moses referred to the Creator as God in the book of John he referred to the Creator as the Word I want to explain to people why John referred to the Creator as the Word I don't think a lot of people know so I just want to take this opportunity to explain if you go to Genesis 15 and 1 it says after these things the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision saying fear not Abraham I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward so uh, the thing that I'm pointing out here is the word of the Lord uh, this word actually appears And to prove it to you, let's just type it in here. The word of the Lord. So when you type in the word of the Lord, every time the word of the Lord appeared in the King James Version Bible, the um, this blue letter Bible, like you say, you can pull it up and it lets you know all the verses where the word of the Lord appears in the Bible. And if you go right here, as you can see, it occurs 300, 
in 28 verses in the King James Version, including 255 exact phrases. Sorry, you gotta excuse me, be a little patient with me. Get this screen, my screen back up. So, the reason that John referred to the Creator as the Word is because John was saying, basically saying, the Word of the Lord, because that is what in um, Old Testament scriptures that is a lot of times what the Creator was referred as to. The word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came. And if you notice here, I have I underlined. That's because it's important. Remember that word um, when you told Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So, um, if you, so if you go back to John 1 in the beginning, it says, in the beginning was the word. And what was John saying? In the beginning was the word of the Lord. So if you go back to Genesis 1 in the beginning, basically what I want to do here is copy and it says Moses used the term God, but you can you can switch these out in any way you want to and you get the exact same meaning. So if you wanted to put in the place of the word God in the book of John, you have in the beginning was God. But what I'm doing right here, I'm taking out um John's version, his words, the word, and I'm going to replace it in Genesis. And so what we have here is in the beginning, the word of the Lord created the heavens and the earth. And when we say the word of the Lord created the heavens and the earth, that is why I told you, remember all those terms and God said, and it was the word of the Lord created the heavens and the earth. Um, now to even con confirm this with scripture, if you go to Psalms 33 and 6, it actually says the same thing. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. So John was actually kind of combining Genesis 1 um, with, you know, Psalms 33 and 6 and other Old Testament scriptures that uses um the phrase the word of the Lord now another thing I want to do to explain um, John 1 I'm not trying to confuse you but it's so you can understand who Christ is God the Son and who Christ and who God is God the Father just like I just took out um, the word of the Lord and replaced it with God we are going to take God from out of the book of Genesis, and we're going to replace it with the word um, in John's testimony. And as you can see, I've already done that here, and we're just going to read, to read through it. In the beginning was God, and God was with God, and God was God. When you replace the word, with God, this verse can appear to be very tricky because what it does, it doesn't make mention of one God in the beginning. It talks about two gods in the beginning. Um, and if you go back to Genesis um, 1 and 26, and God said, let us make man, which I, this is supposed to be Adam in our image. The thing is, when I say right here, let us, who is God talking to in the beginning? Well, because of John 1, we know who God is talking to. God is talking to God. I'm going to go to a verse, John 10 and 30. And basically what I'm doing here, because I don't want to confuse anybody, a lot of people that's new to Christ, new to the Bible, that really don't know the scriptures that well. Most people know already, um, if they spend any time in church, that the word is referring to Jesus Christ. 
So these next few verses I'm going over, it is kind of for those people who know that the word is referring to Jesus Christ. But later on, I'm going to prove with scriptures that the word is referring to Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the word, that Jesus Christ is the word of the Lord. But for right now, I'm trying to explain, so, because I know people confuse, in the beginning was God, and God was with God, and God was God. So if you go to John 10 and 30, this is Christ speaking. He's already a man, made flesh. I and my Father are one. This one is talking about the same thing here. God was God. This one, one indicates that Christ is part of a group of gods. And when I say part of a group of gods, all I'm talking about is more than one God. Um, and when I say more than one God, all I'm basically talking about is two. The Bible never mentions more than two gods. So all I'm saying is two gods. Um, and you like a lot of people might be confused right now if you never heard this, but let me keep going. Don't turn this off. I promise you will be blessed and you'll understand exactly what's going on here as we go through the lesson. So I and my father are one indicates that Christ is part of a group of gods. So let's go to John 14, 17. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. And from henceforth, henceforth, from henceforth, all it means, and from now on, ye know him, is in this referring to the Father, and have seen him. Um, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Basically, mean it is, it is enough for us. Show us God. That's enough for us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet have you not known me? Philip, he that hath seen me, now this is Christ talking, he that hath seen me, so if you've seen Christ, the word, the God that was in the beginning, hath seen the Father, so if you go back to um, John 1, we say, and God was with God, and God was God, um, Christ even says that when you seen me, you seen the Father. And how says um, you then show us the Father? Um, believe you not that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Now, this is a very important statement. Because basically what Christ is saying, he's saying is when you see the Father, you see me. And kind of what that means is that if you was to be looking at God the Father, you would be looking at God the Son. They apparently probably look identical. And they probably look identical in the beginning when, from when John said, and God was with God and God was God. But this statement is very important. Believe thou not. That I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. So like I said, if you go back to John 1 in the beginning, it says God was with God, and God was God. And then when you take this statement, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. What I'm about to do real quick is explain this to everybody so people know exactly what's going on here. How can you be... One, but different. And how can God be in Christ and Christ be in God? As soon as I show you this next image, it's going, all these few verses is going to make perfect sense. So let me just get to this image right here. Basically, what this verse is saying here, believe thou not that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. This is basically saying that Christ and God is linked together and they've been linked together since the beginning. They have always been linked together 
and they will always be linked together. So let's go over this. You got Christ, we're going to say the Son and the Father. As you can see, although there are two separate individuals, they God is in Christ and Christ is in God, making the two one. So these is what those verses mean when he say, in the beginning was the word and the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And when Christ said, Christ, when Christ said, God is in me and I am in Father, they're linked together. That's, th this is what it means right here. So just to go over some more scriptures to confirm that, to confirm that we're going to go to John 16, 15. It says, all things that the Father hath are mine. So because they one and the same, they link together like a chain. Christ saying, everything that the Father hath is mine. And then if you go down to John 17 and 10, he um, kind of says the same thing again. He says, and all mine, but just so you know, this is talking about people. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. So every all the people that I ha have are yours, and all the people that you have are mine. So we go down to John 17, 21. That they all may be one. Now, here's the word one again, and this one means the same thing. This word one indicates that we are part of a group of gods. But now we already know group of gods that we are a part of that is God the Son and God the Father let's go to John 14 um, and verses 5 through 6 Thomas saith unto him Lord we know not whether um, you go and how can we know the way Jesus said unto him I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So what basically what Christ is saying here is that if we want to be one with God, linked to God, the only way for us as human beings to be linked to God is to link ourselves to Christ. Christ is linked to God. If we want to be linked to God, the only way we can do that is linking ourselves to Christ. And by linking ourselves to Christ, we become part of a group of gods. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 11 and 3. But I would have you know um, that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. I've added that verse in there just so people can can realize that what I was just saying before that just as Christ is the head of man, God is the head of Christ. So if we link ourselves to Christ, because God is Christ's head, we link ourselves to God also. Um, these next verses just kind of explain um, a little bit more in detail, you know, using Bible verses, um, how separate entities can be one. And we're just going to read through this as fast as possible. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So we go many, one body, because we all become linked together. So also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, male or female, whether we be bond or free, we have been all made to drink into one spirit. And this is why Christ even says they are one and the same, because God and Christ are one. They think identical. You cannot separate God from Christ, even in the way that they think. They think identical. 
For the body is not one member, but many. This is talking about the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, um, am I not the body? Is it not therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, behold, I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Um, so just kind of explain, basically what he's saying here is that although one body have different, we're one body, but made up of many different people. And the many different people that are linked together and make up this body has different functions like organs do in the body. And he's saying if we if we was all a head, we wouldn't have a body. If we was all an ear, how can we see? If we was all eyes, how can we speak? So um, different members have different functions in the body of Christ. And you can also use this in comparison in comparing God the Father with God the Son. Um, they both are part of the same body, but they have different functions, but they're one and the same. And, and then the same with us, and then we're linked to that body through Christ. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body, and the eye cannot say, Unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again to the nor nor again the head to the to the feet. I have no need of you. So basically, what it's saying right here is every organ in the body is important, and every person in the body of Christ is important. The even Christ Himself, the foot in the body of Christ is just as important as Christ is in the body of Christ. And that's what the scriptures are saying here. Once we are in that body, there is no difference. We all are equally important in the body of Christ. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And these members of the body, which we think are to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tampered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the parts which lacked. Basically, what they said in these verses right here, once again, we just want to compare it to a chain and a chain with a weak link. Um, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And that's basically what the scriptures are saying right here, that if there's a weak link in the body of Christ, that we are supposed to strengthen that weak link and God will strengthen that weak link. So the whole chain is strong. So we'll continue that there should be, um, no shims in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So basically this is saying the same thing. Um, if one person in the body of Christ is suffering, the whole body of Christ is suffering. Actually, I don't want to get into this topic too much now. I'll get into it later. But um, just to give you an idea of what it's talking about is... If we know that there's people in the body of Christ suffering, no matter where they are, no matter where they might be, if we're not helping them and we seeing them suffer, it's something wrong with that. Because if they're suffering, we should be suffering with them. We should not see other Christians suffer and we all don't become one to help that Christian. If you remember in the book of Acts, if you read the Bible, the book of Acts said, the church in the book of Acts, it said they had everything in common and nobody lacked nothing. No man even dared to call anything their own, but they shared everything. They lived an identical life. So if you calling yourselves a Christian, being a part of the body of Christ, 
and you see other people who call themselves Christians struggling, um, no matter where that struggling might be, even financially, if you are not becoming one with that Christian and strengthening that Christian, most likely you're not a real Christian. This is not how um, true members of the body of Christ behave themselves. They're going to do what they can, when they can, um, even if it means suffering with that um, other member, because the because we all part of one body and we all link together. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So now uh, this next, I just I just start off reading First John four. Love comes from God, dear friend. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God, and knows God. Whosoever doeth not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only, he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, now this is a, very important. God lives in us. How, how Christ said earlier, I am in God and God is in me. This is how we link ourselves to Christ and God. This is the only way to link ourselves to Christ and God. As we, and we only can do that through love. If you don't love everybody that you come in contact with, this is not the love of God. You are not linked to the body of Christ. The thing that links us to the body of Christ, to Christ, to God the Father, is love. That is the special link between God and Christ. That's why they are one and the same. That's why you can't separate them because everything that they do is based on love. So where did we leave off here? I was at um, John 17 and 21, and it says, uh, that they all may be one. Well, we're going back down here. As you, as you, Father, are in me, and I in thee. Jesus is saying the same thing here. Their God and Christ are linked together. That they also may be one in us, linked to God by Christ, forming one body. And how do we do that? We, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what does Jesus teach us through his word? Jesus teach us how to love. So if you're reading the Bible and you want to know who God is and you want the stuff you read to take effect and for you to go, Read it knowing that everything in that Bible is based on love. And basically what you want to do when you read that Bible, you want to, anything that you're doing wrong, bad, or evil to people, you want the Word of God to teach you how not to be that way and teach you how to love people. That is the purpose of the Scriptures. When you read the Scriptures, read it to learn how to develop love. If you read the Scriptures with that thought in mind, you will not error. If you have anything else, on your mind while you're reading the scriptures, if you're not totally submitted to God, you are not going to get the uh, what I call the purity of the gospel. It's just not going to work in your life. Um, so we left off also in 1 John 1 and 3. This is 1 John, I mean John chapter 1 verse 3. And he say, all things were made by him. <clears throat> and this is talking about the word. So all things was made by the word. Which and I got God here because in the book of Genesis, it was Christ was called God, but in John it's called the Word. So all things was made by the Word, or God in the beginning, and without God in the beginning or the Word, which they're one and the same in the book of John, was not anything made that was made. Um, this verse fourteen comes from John chapter one, but I skipped. Um, verses 4 through 13 because I want to get I, like I said I want to get straight to the point some of these first lessons that I post um, seem 
rather long. They they do get shorter, but I want people to um, get the gospel and understand it and get it all in at one shot. So if you go down to John chapter one verse fourteen, it says, "And the word, which this is basically me me explaining the word, um, the God that was created." The God that created the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth was made flesh. When it say the word that the God that was in the beginning that created everything, he was made, he was turned into a living body, a person. And when it say dwelt, this word dwelt mean lived among us. He lived on the earth. So God came out of his out of heaven, out of his um, godly body, and he became flesh. And these scriptures I have here just kind of confirm this verse here, and we'll just read through them. Philippians 2, 6 to 8, um, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He was in the form of God. Remember, I showed y'all those two links. Um, every link on the chain is identical. God and Christ are identical. Um, so he was in the form of God, but he took upon himself the form of a servant. It's the form of a servant, is in the, it means the same thing. He was made flesh. And was made like the, and was made in the likeness of men. He came through a woman. He was born. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. So once again, another scripture that say that let you know that God, God was made like of men. 1 Timothy 3 and 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. God was made flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of the angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So we left off here and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is John chapter 1, verse 14. Now we're going into John chapter 1, verse 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. All John is saying is that Christ was better than he was. And there's actually verses in the Bible where um, Christ says God the Father is better than him. So now we're going to Matthew 3 and 1 because I'm this is for people who are new to the Bible, don't know this. Um, I want to prove to them with the scriptures that the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, that word was Jesus. So that's what this next couple of scriptures is going to focus on. Matthew 3 and 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. This word bear means carry. And basically what he's saying here is letting you know when he's back here when I just said um, after me is preferred before me. Right here, John saying he said, I'm not even worthy, worthy to carry his shoes. Whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the gardener but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Basically what this saying here is, and I think I talked about this in my introduction, a fan is actually like a pitchfork. It is used to separate um, the grain from the um, shaft. Um, and basically God saying he's going to, 
Christ is eventually going to come back, gather his saints, separate them from the evil people, and the evil people um, will be burned up with unquenchable fire. And, and this is referring to the lake of fire. Then coming to Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to, to be baptized. So now we got the name Jesus. So then coming to Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John, John the Baptist, to be baptized of him. But John forbid him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Basically, what John was just saying here, John knew that Christ was going to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. So John was saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you don't need to be baptized me. Um, but, you know, and John said, and come as thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, suffer it to be so now, for, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Basically, what Jesus was saying here is that I need to be baptized by you because it is written. Uh, we have to fulfill the prophecies in the Old Testament. Then he suffered him, which means um, John the Baptist baptized Christ. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open, open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the word that was made flesh is Jesus. Um, they was in the beginning together. Um, Jesus became flesh and when he was baptized by John the Baptist. There was confirmation that the God that will be made a man, um, that Jesus was this man that was in the beginning um, with God so basically what I want to go back to do here really quick and so people can understand um, even I want the simplest mass to understand basically since we know that the word um, is referring to Christ now basically all I'm doing here is taking out the word and substituting it for Christ's name so let's read in the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. The same, talking about Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Who was him? Jesus. Jesus made all things. And without him, without Jesus, was not anything made that was made. We're going to go back and do the same thing in Genesis 1 in the beginning. And we're going to substitute, since we know that in the beginning, this God is the word that is mentioned in the book of John. And since we know in the book of John, the word is referring to a Christ, we're just going to replace it with Jesus so you can understand. In the beginning, Jesus created the heavens and the earth. So we left off um, up here also when he said, um, John the Baptist said, after me is preferred before me. So now we're going to go back down and finish that verse. He's, and it says, for he was before me, which means he existed before me. Now, if you're reading the Bible, like we already proved, I'm, I'm sure with enough scriptures that um, Jesus was in the beginning and created the heavens and the earth. But I just wanted to continue to go on because there's other things you're going to read in the Bible about Jesus uh, that I don't want um, newborn babes to be confused on when they read these things. Um, and the reason this seem, might seem a little strange to some people is because when you read about the birth of Jesus, and we're going to read through these scriptures real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. John the Baptist was born before Jesus. But John the Baptist is saying here, he was before me, which means he existed before me. But John the Baptist was born before Jesus. So we finna just go over that really quick. And this starts off in, uh, we go start in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. This is talking about the birth of Jesus being foretold. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled 
at this saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in thy womb to now be pregnant and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus name, this is King James Version, Jesus. This is not how Jesus' name was pronounced in Greek. It is not how Jesus' name was pronounced in Hebrew. Um, Jesus' name in Greek was pronounced Jesus, and Jesus' name in Hebrew was um, Yehoshua. Um, and my, I might be saying that just a little wrong because I don't speak those languages. I don't have the accent. Um, but if you want to know how to how to pronounce Jesus' name in Greek. Or Jesus name in Hebrew I will show you how to do that really quick basically if you go to the blue letter Bible we're going to put in Jesus name All right, we're going to hit Strong's We'll go to the exact verse where you got the name of Jesus is all capitalized. But as you can see, these numbers, they're all the same. Um, G2424, G2424. So if you click on that, this is going to give you, this is Jesus's name in Greek. Now, if you want to know how to pronounce this, all you got to do is hit this button. Strong's G2424. Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus. And now if you want to know how to pronounce Jesus's name in the Hebrew, um, if you, this is Jesus name in the Hebrew. And if you want to know how to pronounce it, Strong's H 3091. Yehoshua. Yehoshua. And second entry. Yehoshua. Yehoshua. So that is how you pronounce Jesus name, um, in the Greek and in the Hebrew and those was the names I mentioned early in my introduction um, so if you ever hear you might hear some people refer, they don't, some people do not like to use the name Jesus because they don't like the King James Version Bible and they associate Jesus with the Antichrist so they use this, so they use the names Jesus or Yahashua um, but Jesus's name in Greek or Hebrew it means Yehovah is salvation so basically what his name means is Jehovah is the name that come out of the Old Testament scriptures. Um, a lot of people believe this is pronounced, is not pronounced correct as Jehovah, like Jehovah Witnesses, and they pronounce it as um, yod heh vav -Heh. Um, So it would be yod heh vav -Heh, he is salvation. So Jesus' name, Jesus' name in the Old Testament is yod heh vav -Heh. And in the New Testament, when he is born of, you know, through the Virgin Mary, his name is yod heh vav -Heh, is salvation. So not only he is he the God in the beginning that created everything, but he's the God that brings salvation also. Um, if you go to Matthew 1 and 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. So um, that's just another scripture to confirm once again that God, um, they're saying they go call Christ Emmanuel because it means God with us. The God that created the heavens and the earth is the God that was um, put into Mary's womb. Um, and this is the same God that died on the cross for our sins. So we're going to go back to Luke 1 and 32. He shall be great and he shall be called the son of the most high and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign forever in the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Um, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, saying, I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power 
of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, this is John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, she also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her. So basically, even before Mary, Christ's mother, was pregnant, um, Elizabeth was already six months pregnant with John the Baptist. So if you go, go back to John the Baptist statement, when John the Baptist says, for he was before me, it was clear that John the Baptist was born before Christ. Uh, but the reason John the Baptist was saying um, Christ is before him is because Christ existed before John the Baptist did, because he was in Christ was in the beginning and created the heavens and the earth. If you go to John eight, um, these um, group of six group of scriptures um, in my Bible is titled as "Before Abraham Was I Am." And we're just going to read through these. Then answered the Jews. The um, If you don't know who the Jews are, I will teach that in another lesson too. But the Jews, the Israelites, and niggers are pretty much one and the same thing. Jews, Israelites, and um, niggers, they're all one and the same. But I'll explain that in another lesson. Then said the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and has devils. So the Jews, the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham are saying, calling Jesus Christ a Samaritan and saying he have a devil. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keeps my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Know we not that thou, now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Basically, what Christ was saying here, he wasn't talking about the consequences of the first death. Christ was talking about the second death and being thrown into the lake of fire. And when he's saying they shall never taste of death, he basically saying, at the resurrection, we are going to live forever. We would never die again at that point. But the Jews back then didn't understand that. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Um, whom makest you yourself? They basically telling Jesus, who do you think you are? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him. They don't They don't know who God is. They're not linked with God because they do not have love in their heart. They don't understand everything is based off of love. But I know him. And if I should, and if I should say I know him not, then I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. This scripture, like I said, I don't want to get too far into it because I want to stick to the subject that um, who Jesus he is and but I, I, I will use a few, a few scriptures just to explain it so you are not confused when did Abraham rejoice um, it say and, and your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad so the, people, the obvious question is when did Abraham see Jesus's day um, and I'll just try to explain this briefly. If you go to Genesis 15, when it says, and God confirms his promises to Abraham, uh, we'll just read through this really quick. I might skip some of the verses if I do, forgive me. It say, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Basically what Abraham is talking about here, he asks God, how shall I know that I'm going to inherit the promised land? And he said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old and a she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece against one another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, um, Abram drove them away. 
And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. So basically, when Ab Abraham fell asleep, Abraham had a nightmare. Um, and we, okay, we'll just read. And he said unto Abraham, Know for a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Um, in this dream, and like I say, I will get into this also in another lesson, because I don't want this lesson is already going over an hour. But basically, the dream that Abraham had, Abraham seen the Jews mistreating Christ and handing Christ over to the Romans and Christ being crucified. That was the nightmare that he had. And basically, what um, when God said, "Is no for a surety that thy seed shall be in a stranger in the land." Not of their own, not of not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. This is the punishment that the Jews have to suffer for crucifying Christ. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go unto thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So basically, what God is saying. He asked God, um, how shall I know? Shall I hear it? God pretty much let him know that he's going to die. Um, but I want to share these other scriptures with you really quick. So you just know these. If you go to Hebrews 11 verses 8 through 10, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called um, to go into a place which he should after, which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went by faith he sojourned he sojourned into the land of promise as a strange as as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles in other words abraham lived in tents with isaac and jacob the heirs of him the same the heirs of the same promise now this is very important for he looked for a city which had foundations, who builder and maker is God. Most people think Abraham was clueless to the New Testament and to some of the things that we just know today. But Abraham was not clueless. Abraham knew exactly what was going on. Abraham knew about Christ had to be crucified. Abraham knew about the resurrection. And Abraham understood that he was not going to inherit the land until Christ came back. Because when you say here for he looked for a city which had foundations, he was not looking for a place um, on earth at that time, because that's why he said he knew that he was in a strange country. So when you say he looked for a city which had foundations, I'm going to explain to you the city that Abraham looked for with foundations. If you go to Revelation 21, it talks about New Jerusalem. And I don't want to read all of these, um, so I will just, I'll, I'm going to scroll down to some of these verses, but it's talking about New Jerusalem. And I'll start here in verse 12. And had a wall great and high, um, and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names went thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Um, on the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates, three gates, on the south, three gates. And on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So Abraham knew that um, Christ had to be born, crucified, ascended to the heavens and come back before the promise would be fulfilled. And the city that Abraham was looking for, and here we go, is the, the, is the city that had foundations. So what Abraham was looking for, was waiting for, and then was the new Jerusalem. And just to confirm this, I'll use another scripture. This scripture is coming out of Hebrews chapter 11, but it's verse 13. It said, and it's talking about Abraham, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, 
and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers strangers and pilgrims on the earth they knew that this earth was being controlled by satan and that christ will have to come back defeat satan before they inherit the promise um so we're here in 57 let's see where do we leave off um we, we was at john chapter 8 verse 57 then said the jews unto him um, you are not yet 50 years old um, and how ha, and 50 years old and have you seen Abraham Jesus so basically they saying Abraham done died thousands of thousands of years ago you not even 50 years old how are you talking about you seen Abraham Jesus said unto them verily verily I say unto you before Abraham was I am now, when Jesus was saying before Abraham was, I am, they knew what Jesus was saying when he said, I am. Basically, what Jesus was saying, he was saying before Abraham was, I am the almighty God. If you, I believe it's verse 49, I don't have it in here, but because actually after he said this, they tried to stone Jesus. Jesus. Jesus confessed to them that before Abraham was, he was the almighty God. Basically, I want to use a few scriptures to confirm when Jesus said, I am explaining it. If you go to Genesis 17 and 1, and when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, here we go, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. That was Jesus. Genesis 28 and 13, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. This was Jesus before he was made flesh. This is what Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Genesis 35 and 11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of your loins. Exodus 3 and 6. Moreover, he said, I am God of the Father. I, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall we say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. This is why Christ, when they questioned Christ, when God, when Christ said before Abraham was, I am. This is what Christ was referring to. Even when Moses was talking to the burning bush that wasn't consumed, when the when God was speaking to Moses, letting Moses know that he was going to send him back to rescue, deliver the children of Israel. He said, I am that I am. And he said, thus shall thy say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. So that's Jesus, even out of his own mouth, confessing that he was the Lord God Almighty. Um, um, I am the God, I am um, your Lord God Almighty, the Father, the, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's Jesus confessing out of his own mouth that he was in the beginning, that he created the heavens and the earth. Um, this next set of scriptures I want to use is to confirm even out of God's own testimony that Christ um, was God in the beginning. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he said, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers of, his ministers of flame of fire. But unto the Son, this is talking about Christ. This is God talking to Christ. But unto the Son, he said, Thou throne, O God, 
This is God the Father calling God the Son, God, he is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God. So he calls Christ God. And he said, therefore, God, even your God. So Christ is a God and God is a God over Christ hath anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. And, and thou, Lord, this is still God the Father talking. He said, and he once again, he's calling Christ Lord. And look what he says about Christ. In the beginning has laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even in the book of Hebrews, God's testimony is that Christ in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of his hand. Um, here, John 6 and 38, for I come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him, the will of the father that sent me. So Christ saying when he came down from heaven, this is Christ again testifying, saying I came from heaven. Um, but I've come to do the will of the Father that sent me. If you go to 1 Peter 1 and 2, it says, Who verily was foreordained. Foreordained means he was appointed to do the will of the Father. But look what it says here. It says, before the foundations of the world. So before Christ ever created the galaxy, before there was the first day of the creation, the beginning, there's a few scriptures in the Bible that lets you know that God appointed him not only to create the heavens and the earth, but God appointed him to do something else. And this was even before the earth ever existed. So, there, so the, God had a plan. Because Christ was foreordained to do something before Christ ever start creating the heavens and the earth. And if we continue to read, it say, um, was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest. This manifest means he came down from heaven in these last times for you. Let's go to Titus 1 and 2. In hope of eternal life. Which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So even before Christ start creating the galaxies, you know, the before before in the beginning when God created, before any of that happened, it says that God made a promise before the world began that man will have eternal life. There's another verse that I found just reading through the Bible that I thought was very interesting. And I'll explain to you why I thought this was very interesting. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. When I first read this voice, first read this verse, I was kind of puzzled. Um, but I study a lot and I believe I eventually, I believe I found what this means when it says declaring the end from the beginning. When I read this, I kept going back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Um, not too long ago, I started trying to learn how to read Hebrew and Greek, uh, mainly Hebrew. So if you go... And I will pull this screen back up really quick. And let's type in. Genesis 1. We're going to turn on the Strong's Concordance. And you see this word here in the beginning. And we're going to click to see what that word is. So in the beginning, is it doesn't really, in the Hebrew, it doesn't really say in the beginning. It says um, Rasheth. Rasheth.
So Rasheth. So basically what I did to help you understand this, I, this is the word Rasheth. Now Hebrew, you read from um, right to left. It's not like English where you read from left to right. Um, and just like our alphabet, each letter has a name like A is A. Um, it's the same thing for Hebrew. Now the Hebrew that we see today, um, this is a like a recent Hebrew. And uh, these these are the names of the alphabet: Rush, Alpha, Shin, Yod, Taz. These the these are the names for these letters. Now in ancient Hebrew, um, the, these Hebrew letters come from ancient Hebrew, right here. Um, and this was what these letters looked at like in Moses's day. So when Moses wrote beginning, this is where he wrote. He put a face. Uh, like a head of a um, cow. This is what he wrote. Now, there's all type of, you can find um, Hebrew charts everywhere to let you know what these letters mean. But basically, this represented a head. Um, the alpha represented a leader of some sort. Um, the E kind of represent eat, as you can see, like kind of look like an E here, or destroy, kind of like to devour, eat, chew some up. Um, this represented an uh, arm and like a hand, and this is a cross. Taz was written as a cross. The reason I'm showing you this is because I just think this is very interesting. Um, oh, and also, if you ever wondered why in the book of Genesis they created a golden calf, is because this is the calf alpha. And, you know, alpha and omega um represents the first and the last alpha and omega is the, are the uh, greek letters the first and the last letter in the greek alphabet so that's why they made a golden calf because it kind of represented alpha but when you look at this head leader destroy arm cross even just saying it like that head leader destroy hand cross it actually i believe is talking about um, the promises that God made. Let's go. Let's go back to that verse so we can read it again. It says, "Declaring the end from the beginning." Now, this is the beginning. Declaring the end. Alpha represents God. This represents Christ. Son of God destroyed. Hands cross. That. I believe that's talking about Christ being nailed to the cross. And I believe that's why the verse here declaring the end from the beginning. So I would like to close with this last set of scriptures coming out of John chapter 17 verses 1 through 5. And like I said, we'll just read them. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. And you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. And Jesus, whom you have sent, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify you me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In closing, I would just like to say, to all the inhabitants of the earth, the gospel of the kingdom have been preached. And now you know who Jesus Christ really is.